Mr. Anderson, thank you so much for joining me. It's a great pleasure. You're and uh, I was wondering for how long you have been covering Bilderbergs. I've been covering them since 2010 when they met in Sit Jay's Spain. Uh, Jim Tucker, the late great American Free Press Bilderberg hound, pioneering in many ways for this group, covering this nefarious group, showed me the ropes starting that year. And I've covered it every year on the ground except for last year, 2016, in Dresden, Germany. Uh, but it's, it's been a, a whirlwind experience and, and very educational, um, especially taking over since Jim uh, passed away in April of 2013. Yeah, Jim came from the old school of reporting. He was a copy editor and sports writer here in the greater Virginia area. And he, in 1975, heard through the grapevine, when American Free Press used to be called the Spotlight, he heard through the grapevine that there was this group of high-flying businessmen and finance ministers and, and uh, prime ministers, current and former, uh, bankers, uh, some royalty media that show up but don't report but participate in these inside closed meetings. He heard about that and he was flabbergasted that the press would let a group of businessmen get away with that. So he happened to meet the, um, the late Willis Cardo who founded Liberty Lobby and later uh, the Spotlight which became American Free Press and uh, when he met Willis Cardo in the mid-70s and Cardo told Jim Tucker about Bilderberg, uh, that's when he, was, he became just livid that this would be happening without wide public knowledge. And then Jim vowed to work for the spotlight and begin to pick up the scent on Bilderberg that very year, right around 1974-75. And he did it solid until 2013, or excuse me, 2012. And the last time he was here was in Chantilly, which was the last time Bilderberg was here in 2012. So that's that's the basic outline of it. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, so when analyzing Bilderberg every year, looking into it, what what do you like uh, specifically look into? Like, what is your kind of plan when um, analyzing the attendees list and the agenda? What what kind of things do you look into there? One example is what other organizations are here on a regular basis every year. They're kind of like the members in good standing, the, you know, the Trilateral Commission, the Brookings Institution, the Council on Foreign Relations, which is the American version of the British Chatham House, the Royal Institute of International Affairs. They're always here. They're the always here people. And so you look at sort of the core group, and, and many of them are on the 30, 31 member steering committee that decides what to discuss, who to invite, where to go. And you look at them and then you look at the add-ons, the people that are maybe first-timers or only are here one time and you never see them again, or they're first-timers and they keep coming. Uh, Eric Schmidt would be an example. He began showing up around 2012, 2013, and then became the head of Alphabet after Google. And Eric, so Eric Schmidt and many of the tech guys have now become regular, the high techies. So you look at the dynamics, then you look at what appears in the press right before, right after Bilderberg meetings, and what's changing with, with those companies, what deals are they striking, and how does that benefit the core Bilderberg members and, and benefit the network? Because what Bilderberg is, is basically one example of private government where uh, the wealthiest interests of the world create their own governmental system and basically rent the regular governments for military needs and certain financial and basic processes. So, you know, so much wealth has accumulated into so few hands over time that it's almost not surprising at all that eventually these wealthy interests would create their own governance system altogether. And Bilderberg is a symptom of that coming out of the Second World War, coming out of the Bretton Woods Agreement. So, Is there any uh, specific point on the agenda or any participant, or maybe both, on the list this year that surprised you? Yes. Uh, the, part, the thing that surprised me the most, well, three things. The most is that there are four White House officials, Wilbur Ross, the Commerce Secretary, H.R. McMaster, the National Security Advisor, Nadia Shadlow, a assistant national security official with McMaster, and a um, Christopher Liddell, a strategic um, advisor in the White House. It is highly unusual for four currently serving White House officials to be at a meeting like this, let alone Bilderberg itself. That was the most surprising. The next thing in line would be two sitting U.S. senators instead of one. Lindsey Graham of South Carolina, a neocon pro-war Republican, was in Dresden last year, but many thought that would be his own Bilderberg meeting. 
his only Bilderberg meeting, excuse me, but he returned this year and brought along Tom Cotton, another very militaristic Republican U.S. Senator out of Arkansas. Second surprise, the third one was triple the number of journalists inside who are taking part, participating, breaking bread with Bilderberg, but not reporting, carrying on that tradition of basically breaking the trust with their readers and viewers. So um, whereas you'd normally find three or four reporters, five tops, there's 15 here this year. The Swiss Post, a couple of Norwegian, one or two Norwegian publications, several out of Italy, uh, Portugal, Spain, and uh, plus the Americans, uh, Peggy, Peggy Noonan of the Wall Street Journal and, uh, and others that are common, Martin Wolf of the Financial Times, one additional Financial Times reporter. That's not usually the case. The Financial Times represents the financial center of the, of the elite, and that's the city of London, the square mile. That's the Financial Times is literally right out of there. And so that's, those are the three most surprising things. All right. Thank you very much. Um, so how would you judge the overall consent maybe at just from the people being there and what they have maybe said in the in the past how would you uh, judge the overall consent on uh, the issue of Donald Trump oh you mean Bilderberg's view of Donald Trump yeah maybe I was uh, I was speaking to we are change about that and it's a tough call because on the domestic front uh, including trade which is partially international Donald Trump so, sounds, looks, and acts and smells like a nationalist, a pro-American, put America first nationalist. He got us out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. He took us out of the Paris Climate Accord, evidently because like the TPP, that would also hurt the U.S. economy. And NAFTA, the third leg in the stool, is on shaped, shaky ground, the North American Free Trade Agreement, which is about 22 years old. And anyway, so the... Um, The other thing, though, the other side of the coin is that uh, he, he launched those missiles into Syria uh, not so long ago, uh, maybe six weeks ago, these, these uh, 60 or so cruise missiles, um, showing that he was not in bed with Russia. You know, otherwise, he wouldn't attack a Russian ally like Syria. Dropped the Moab bomb on an alleged uh, terrorist cave in Afghanistan in a war that we can't win. He's not pulling our troops out of Afghanistan. We've got more there than we're told. He's not really pulling us out of the Mid Middle East quagmire and then uh, making this uh, multi-billion dollar, hundreds of billion dollar arms deal with the very rogue Saudi regime, which is in uh, a rough alliance with, with the Israelis. And they, um, like Bilderberg, the Saudis, the Israelis, And Donald Trump, according to his statements, wants to help take down Iran and Syria, pull out of the Iran deal, which is more in tune with Bilderberg, more of an internationalist, uh, um, uh, call it Bilderberg-style foreign policy. So will the real Donald Trump please stand up? We have the nationalist on the domestic front and the internationalist on the foreign policy front. Which is it?